All right, welcome back. This is chapter eight, and the picture for today looks like maybe a, um, what is it called, bifocal, no, nope. monocle, where you have just the one lens. Maybe it's a monocle, I don't know. Every other time has been glasses, so we'll see. Chapter eight. Oh, and there's like spiders on one side, and looks like maybe smoke on the other. We'll see what it is. At this point, you're probably expecting to read something like, I suddenly realized that everything I thought I had known was untrue. Though, I'll likely use that exact phrase. I should warn you that it is misleading. Everything I knew was not untrue. In fact, many of the things I'd learned about the world were quite true. For instance, I knew that the sun came up every day. That was not untrue. Though, admittedly, the sun shone on a geography I didn't understand. I knew that my homeland was named the United States of America. That was not untrue. Though the USA was not actually run by senators, presidents, and judges, but instead by evil librarians. I knew that sharks were annoying. This also was not untrue. There's actually nothing witty to add here. Sharks are annoying, particularly, particularly the carnivorous kind. You have been warned. I stared up at the enormous wall map and suddenly realized something. Everything I thought I'd known about the world was untrue. He said he would say it. This can't be real, I whispered, stepping back. I'm afraid it is, Alcatraz, Singh said, laying a hand on my shoulder. That's the world, the entire world, both the Hushlands and the Free Kingdoms. This is the thing that the librarians don't want you to know about. I stared. But it's so big. And indeed it was. The Americas were there, represented accurately. The other continents, Asia, Australia, Africa, and the rest were there as well. They were collectively labeled, na labeled inner libraria on the map. But I recognized them easily enough. The difference then was the new continents. There were three of them pressed into the oceans between the familiar continents. Two of the new continents were smaller, perhaps the size of Australia. One, however, was very large. It sat directly in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right between America and Japan. It's impossible, I said. We would have noticed a landmass like that sitting in the middle of the ocean. You think you would have noticed, Singh said, but the truth is that the librarians control the information in your country. How often have you personally been out sailing in the middle of what you call the Pacific Ocean? I paused. But simply because I haven't been there doesn't mean anything. The ocean is like kangaroos and grandfathers. I believe that other people have seen it. Ship captains, airplane pilots, satellite images. Satellites controlled by the librarians, Bastille said, regarding the map with her sunglasses. Your pilots fly guided by instruments and maps that, that the librarians provide. And not many people sail boats in your culture, particularly not into the deep ocean. Those who do are bribed, threatened, brainwashed, or most often carefully misled. Singh nodded. Those other, con those other continents make sense, if you think about it. I mean, a planet that is 70% water? What would be the point of that much wasted space? I'd never have thought people would buy that lie, but... I had I not studied Hushlander cultures. People go along with what they're told, Bastille said. Even intelligent people believe what they read and hear, assuming they're given no, no reason to question. I shook my head. A hidden gas station? I can believe. But this? This isn't some little cover-up or misdirection. There are three new continents on the map. Not new, Singh said. The cultures of the free kingdoms are quite well established. Indeed, they're far more advanced than Hushlander cultures. Bastille nodded. The librarians conquered the backward sections of the first of the world first. They're easier to control. But, I said, what about Columbus? What about history? Lies, Singh said quietly. Fabrications, many of them. The rest are distortions. I mean... Haven't you always wondered why your people supposedly developed guns after more techno technology advanced weapons like swords? No, swords aren't more advanced than guns. Singh and Bastille shared a glance. That's what they want you to believe, Alcatraz, Singh said. That way, the librarians can keep the powerful technology for themselves. Don't you think it's strange that nobody in your culture carries swords anymore? No, I said, holding up my hands. Singh, most people don't need to carry swords or even guns. You've been beaten down, Bastille said quietly. You're docile, controlled. We are happy, I said. Yes, Singh said. You're quite happy and completely ignorant, exactly like you're supposed to be. Don't you have a phrase that says ignorance is bliss? 
The librarians came up with that one, Bastille said. I shook my head. No, I said, this is too much. I was willing to overlook the self-driving cars. The magic glasses, well, they could be some kind of trick. Sneaking into a library, that sounded fun. But this, this is ridiculous. I can't accept it. And likely, you hushlanders are thinking the same thing. You're saying to yourself, the story just lost me. It degenerated into pure silliness. And since only silly people enjoy silliness, I'm going to read a book about a boy who's, whose dog gets killed by his mother. Twice. Before you embark upon your voyage into canine aside, I'd like to offer a single argument for your consideration. Plato. Plato was a funny little Greek man who lived a long time ago. He is probably best known for two things. First, for writing stories about his friends. And second, for ph ph philosophically proving that somewhere in the eternities there exists a perfect slice of cheesecake. At this moment, however, the reader should be less interested in cheesecake and more interested in caves. One cave, to be specific. Plato tells a story about a group of prisoners who lived in a very special cave. The prisoners were tied up, heads held so they could only face one direction, and all they could see was the wall in front of them. A fire behind them threw shadows up on the wall, and these shadows were the only things the prisoners ever knew. To them, the shadows were their world. As far as they knew, there was nothing else. However, one of these prisoners were, was eventually released and saw that the world was much more than just shadows. At first, he found this new world very, very strange. Once he learned of it, however, he returned and tried to tell his friends about it. They, however, didn't trust him and didn't want to listen to him. They didn't want to believe in this new world because it didn't make, them, make sense to them. You hushlanders are like these people. You have, through no fault of your own, lived your entire life believing in the shadows of the, li the librarians have shown you. The things I reveal in this narrative will seem like nonsense to you. There is no getting around this. No matter how logical my arguments are, they will seem illogical to you. Your mind, struggling to find ways to hold on to your librarian lies, will think of all kinds of ridiculous concerns. You will ask questions such as, but what about tidal patterns? Or, but how can you explain the lack of increased fuel costs created by airplanes flying around these hidden land masses? Since nothing I can say would be able to pierce your delusions, let the fact that I make no arguments stand as ultimate proof that I am right. As Plato once said that his friend, Socrates once said, I know that I'm right because I'm the only person humble enough to admit that I'm not. Or something like that. I stood for a long moment, staring up at that map. Part of me, most of me, resisted what I was seeing. And yet... The things I had experienced bounced around in my head, reminding me that many things, like gas station coolers and young men who set fires in kitchens, were not always as simple as they appeared. I'll deal with this later, I finally said, turning away from the map. Let's keep moving. Finally, Bastille said. You hushlanders, honestly, sometimes it seems like it would take a hammer to the face to get you to wake up and see the truth. Now, Bastille, Singh said as we walked by a long row of low sorting carts, that really isn't fair. I think young Lord Smedry is doing quite well, all things considered. It isn't every day that... Gack! Singh said this last part as he suddenly and without apparent reason tripped and fell to the ground. I frowned, looking down, but Bastille burst into motion. She hopped dexterous, dexterously over Singh, then grabbed me by the arm and threw me to the ground behind the sorting cart. She ducked down beside me. Why? I begged, rubbing my arm in annoyance. Bastille, however, clapped a hand over my mouth, shooting me a very hostile, very persuasive, silencing look. I fell quiet. Then I heard something. Voices approaching. Bastille removed her hand, then carefully peeked out over the sorting cart. I moved to do likewise, and Bastille shot me another glance. I could see the glare even through her sunglasses. This time, however, I refused to be cowed. If she can look, so can I, I thought stubbornly. I didn't spend 13 years being a troublemaker so I could get pushed around by a girl my age, even if she is a pretty good shot with that handbag of hers. I peeked over the cart. In the distance, moving between two lines of enormous bookshelves, I could see a group of figures. Most looked like they were wearing dark robes. Librarian apprentices, Singh whispered, peeking up beside me, doing their tasks. Somewhere in this room, the master librarians have placed one misfiled volume. The apprentices have to find it. I eyed the nearly endless rows of tightly packed bookshelves that could take years, I whispered. Singh nodded. Some go insane from the pressure. They're usually the ones who get promoted first. I shivered at the group as the group moved off. There were a couple of much larger figures following them, and these weren't dressed in robes. 
They were entirely white, and their bodies moved in a non-quite natural manner. They lumbered as they stepped, arms held too far to the sides. They trailed beside, behind the librarian apprentices, moving with ponderous steps, some carrying stacks of books. I squinted, looking closer. The whitish figures glowed slightly, giving off a dark haze. The apprentices and the white figures turned a corner, disappearing from view. What were those? I whispered. Those white things that were with them. Alivened, Bastille said, shivering. She glanced at me, standing up. When Sing trips, Smedry always ducks. Always, excuse me. When Sing trips, Smedry always duck. You trip whenever there's danger? Of course not, Sing said. I only trip when there's danger, and when tripping will be helpful, or at least that's usually the way it works. Better than your talent, Oculator, Bastille said with a snort. Do you want to tell me how you managed to break the carpet? I glanced down. The carpet lay unraveled around me, separated by individual into individual strands of yarn. So here's what they were seeing. seeing. Kind of like a, looks like maybe he's made up of pages, that creature. And then, so they said... He's called Alivened. Maybe pages of a book came to life or something. And then here's the evil librarians. And then uh, Alcatraz and Bastille. Come on, Bastille said. We should keep moving. I nodded, as did Singh, and we continued along the perimeter of the musty library chamber. We walked in silence. The sight of the apprentices had reminded us of the need for stealth. However, it quickly grew apparent to me that searching through that room would lead us to the sands of Rashid. Despite the room's many alcoves, the thousands upon thousands of bookshelves made it feel like a crucible filled office for demonic bibli uh, bibliophiles. It didn't seem like the kind of place where once, where once kept objects of great power. I figured that the sands would be in a locked room or perhaps a laboratory, not a vast storage chamber. I spotted a stairwell to the right, and I waved to the others. We should go up to the second floor. Bastille raised an eyebrow. We haven't finished checking this room yet. We don't have time, I said, glancing at the hourglass. Grandpa Smedry had given me. This room is too big. Besides, it doesn't feel right. We're going to let the fate of the world rest on your feelings, she said flatly. He is our oculator, Bastille, Singh reminded her. If he says we go up, then we go up. Besides, he's probably right. The sands aren't likely to be here in the stacks. Somewhere in this building should be a lens forge. That's where we'll, we've, they've probably got the sands. Bastille sighed, then shrugged. Whatever, she said, pushing past me to lead the way toward the stairs. I was a little bit surprised that they'd listened to me. I followed Bastille, and Singh took the rear. The stairwell was made of stone, and it reminded me distinctly of something one might find in a medieval castle. It wound in circles around itself, and an encased and was encased entirely in a massive stone pillar, lit by little frosted windows that let in marginal amounts of daylight. After several minutes of climbing the, the steep steps, I was puffing. Shouldn't we have reached the second floor by now? Space distortion, Bastille said from in front of me. You didn't honestly expect the librarians to confine their entire base into a building as small as this one looks. No, I said. I saw the stretching aura outside, but, I mean, how far up can that stairwell go? As far as it needs to, Bastille said testily. I sighed, but continued to climb. By that logic, the stairwell could go on forever. I didn't, however, want to contemplate that point. For how advanced you people always claim to be, I noted, you'd think that the librarians would have elevators in their buildings. Bastille snorted. Elevators? How primitive. Well, they're better than stairs. Of course they aren't, Bastille said. It took society centuries to develop from the elevator to the flight of stairs. I frowned. That doesn't make any sense. Stairs are far less advanced than elevators. She glanced over her shoulder, looking at me over the top of her sunglasses. I was annoyed to note that she didn't seem the least bit winded. Don't be silly, she said. Why would elevators be more advanced than stairs? Obviously, stairs take more effort to climb, are harder to construct, and are far more healthy to use. Therefore, they took longer to develop. Don't you realize how silly you sound when you claim otherwise? No, I said annoyed. The opposite is silly to me. And does everything you say have to sound like an insult? Only when I intend to be insulting, she said, turning and resuming her climb. I sighed, looking back at Singh, who just shrugged and smiled, still carrying his gym bag of guns. We kept moving. Stairs are more advanced than elevators, I thought. Ridiculous. Just like swords are more advanced than guns. Caves. Caves, shadows, and cheesecake. 
We eventually reached the top of the stairwell, and it opened out into a long hallway constructed of stone blocks. Along this hallway was a line of large, thick wooden doors set into stone archways. This is more like it, I said. I'll bet the sands are behind one of these doors. Well, Bastille said, let's try one then. I nodded, then walked up to the first door. I listened at it for a moment, but either there was no sound on the other side of the wood, or the wood was so thick that I couldn't hear anything. See any darkness around the door, Bastille whispered. I shook my head. The dark oculator probably isn't in there then, Bastille said quietly. It could open into anything, Singh said. Well, we'll never find the sand if we keep to the hallways, Bastille said. I glanced at the other doors. None of them seemed to glow any more than the others. Bastille was right. We had to start trying them, and any one was as good as the next. So I took a breath and pushed against the door in front of me. I'd intended to move it open slightly so we could peek in, but the door swung far more easily than I'd expected. It flew open, exposing the large room beyond, and I stumbled into the doorway. The room was filled with dinosaurs. Real, live, moving dinosaurs. One of them waved at me. I paused for a moment. Oh, I finally said. Is that all? I was worried that I might find something strange in here. You know, finding live dinosaurs in a random room in a library is not strange, especially one that waves. All right, that is chapter eight. Tune in tomorrow to read along with me or to listen to chapter nine. Thanks for listening.